Good morning. How are we all doing? I want to figure out what kind of 11, 15-ish service you are because they preach at a lot of churches and the 9 a.m. is usually like the walking dead, right? There's like four people there and no one shows up. But the 9 a.m. is good here. It's a good 9 a.m. I think it has a lot to do with the spirit moving in the worship. So we'll find out if you just are a dead 11 or if you, know, you guys just woke up because you're young or you got up 40 hours ago because you're old. We'll figure, we'll figure out which one. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter eight. So if you've got a Bible, you can flip there. Uh, we're preaching out of the NIV. So feel free to turn there. And uh, my name is Eddie. I am uh, planting a church called Bay City Church. Uh, it is a uh, church plant that will be in the southeast part of San Francisco, the Bayview, Hunters Point neighborhoods, Dog Patch, all of the southeast. And um, I've, been, I've been waiting to plant a church for a long time. I, was, uh, I became a Christian at 18 years old in college. And uh, six months later, I wanted to plant a church. Yeah, so if you know anything about an 18-year-old, you know that they can't do anything, let alone plant a church. So I waited, rightfully, and uh, it's been about 13 years since I, since I had that goal, and here we are. And so I've been looking forward to this a long time. Me and my family, we just moved back to the Bay Area. I was uh, away for a long time. I played, uh, I went to college in the University of Idaho, which is the exact opposite of the Bay Area, like in every way, shape, or form the opposite, more cows than people there. And uh, played, I played five years in the National Football League in the NFL. I played for different teams all over the country, uh, the Redskins, the Seahawks, the Browns, all over. And so, um, and then I lived in, to moved to Salt Lake City, which doesn't have a football team. I just moved there and um, was there for three years doing ministry until God decided to uh, work his magic, so to speak, and call uh, me and my family back to the Bay Area because we had been waiting for a long time. Now, one of the biggest reasons I, we didn't come earlier was, you know, there's always a lot of human inter, you know, interference with what God's doing, uh, is the cost. Because that's the reason people don't want to come here. It's too expensive, right? So it's not, it's not exactly a fiscally responsible thing to do to just even live in the Bay Area. It's just, it's dumb financially, okay? Let's just be honest. <laughs> so when we lived in Salt Lake City, I had a house and a good job and family and the whole deal, doing ministry. And uh, it got to the point where God was just pulling on us so much that we just felt like, you know, me and my wife talked to each other one night and she said, we feel like we'd be telling God no if we didn't come back to the barrier and plant this church because it was his, his call was so palpable. And, and one of the, the reasons we want to come back to the Bay Area is obviously the people. The people here are great. You guys are all, you guys are all them. So that's awesome. You guys are great. People are amazing. I, I, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm just born and bred. I love the Bay Area. I, I, uh, there's a lots of great guys that come in and plant churches from Arizona and Texas. I was like, praise God, we need more churches. But man, I'm from here and I love, I just love the Bay. It's just, it's just in me. And so to come back, I really wanted to help the people, but I understand why people move to San Francisco that aren't from here. I get it. You know, you've got Silicon Valley, you've got San Francisco. There's this allure with, with tech. And most people, if we're honest, they're coming, they're coming to make money. They're coming because there's an opportunity at a company, there is an IPO to be had. There is a new startup to be uh, partaken of. There is uh, all of these different avenues to make money or the healthcare system or whatever it may be. And so the, the, the shadow, I guess, of the city in all its beauty and all of its amazingness and all of the great people, the shadow is that sometimes when people come to San Francisco, they can become, they eventually become made known by what they're trying to achieve in the city. And so they come for fame and all of a sudden fame masters them. They come for money and all of a sudden money masters them. They come for uh, cars and fun and nightlife and transportation and beauty and all of a sudden the thing that they came for, the good things ultimately become uh, God things or ultimate things. They, become, they begin to own them. And so our hope for Bay City Church is actually the very opposite. We don't come with an, in an individualistic mindset where uh, we don't wanna plan a, yet another church that someone can kind of attach to their, their climb of the corporate ladder and use as their spiritual uh, crutch as they climb up to ascending their ultimate American dream. That's not what we're looking for. We're actually, uh, rather than calling people to an individualistic lifestyle, we're calling people to a, a corporate one. One that instead, instead builds up oneself, pours oneself out for the betterment of others. Wouldn't that be an, a fantastic idea that the church would be, uh, that would exist for the people outside of its walls? Wouldn't that be an amazing idea? Well, that's the church we're trying to focus on. That's the church we're trying to build. 
The people are, ma- are flocking here all over, making themselves known. Dollar, family. Well, we're actually coming, while people come to make themselves known, we're actually, we come to make Jesus known in this city. That what if instead of, of building the brand of our church, we built the brand of Christ? What if we wore Christ instead of our church logo? What if we did that? Well, that's what we're trying to do. It's very different. It's very difficult to do. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, you know, the, the countless hours we've put in terms of raising money and finding people because it's so difficult to, to build something like this and manufacture that it's just taking a long time. But we believe that God, Jesus says he will build his church and he's in the process of building another one, hopefully in the ilk of what we have here at New North to be something amazing in San Francisco. So I just couldn't be more excited, uh, more thrilled. And you know, it's to exist for people outside of your walls real quick. I mean, it's very easy to like people that, that you like, right? Like, I, I was talking to a friend one, uh, not, too, not, not too long ago, and he said, I was like, you gotta exist for people outside of you. And he's like, what are you talking about? I do it all the time. I mean, my kids, my wife. I was like, yo, man, you're married to your wife. You're, you're stuck. I mean, you got, you got to invest in her. You got your kids. Like, you're not going anywhere. You know, they, 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 um, they, they, they help you in a way. They, 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 they're alongside of you in a way. So they're part of you. What about your enemies? Jesus loved his enemies. Do we love our enemies in the same way that we love our own children? That's the type of build, that's the type of church we're trying to build. Now, to think outward like this, it requires a different mindset. Like, I get that. Like, it's very different. To build a multi-ethnic, multicultural church in San Francisco, multi-socioeconomic church is incredibly difficult. It feels like it's impossible. And truthfully, maybe it is. Apart from God, it probably is. So it requires a different mindset. One that's not individualistic, but one that is corporate. And, and, and for some of us, it's challenging to hear that. It's challenging to hear that. Well, wait a second. I mean, I, um, I, I put myself out there. I, I earn my money. I, I'm growing. I'm learning. I, I'm the one that's making my money and building up my kids. What's wrong with building up my, my, my own self, my empire? So nothing's inherently wrong with it. But God calls us to something greater than that. He's not calling us just to build our empire. He's called us to scatter across the country, across the world, and make people hear about Jesus. So that's our goal. And I understand that's a challenging mindset. But really what I'm, not, what I'm talking about here, oh, I should mention, I'm losing my voice, okay? If you can't tell. So I don't always sound like Vin Diesel. I just sound like him right now. <laughs> I, uh, I, I preached obviously the morning service, but I preached the, sat- I preached the Saturday uh, thing, a Friday thing, and all week we were gone preaching. But I'm preaching the gospel, okay? So like, I, I love preaching the gospel. I love Jesus. I'm gonna preach Jesus. I hope my voice goes out. It's a great way for your voice to go out. So the devil doesn't want me, you to hear the word we got, but not today, Satan. We're gonna preach it, okay? Amen. We're gonna hear it, amen? amen? Amen. So what I'm not talking about here is actions. You actually uh, going out and doing things. I'm actually talking about where you get your hierarchy of authority. This is what I'm actually talking about. I'm not saying, what do I do? Is this guy trying to change my behavior in a Christian behavior? No, I'm trying to figure out where your authority is. So where do you get your authority? And if you're confused by that word, let me give you a definition. So this is my definition of authority. That authority is the rightful, actual, and unimpeded power to act possess, or dispose of, okay? Authority is the rightful, actual, unimpeded power to act, possess, or dispose of. So, power to act, unimpeded. That's what I'm talking about. For many Americans, we do not view God as our authority. We just don't, even Christians. Who's our authority? Does anybody know? It's not the president. Who is it? Ourselves. We view ourselves as our own authority. We don't view God this way. So in order to figure out who your authority is, because it could be somebody else, it could be you, it could be God, you need to ask yourself this question. Who or what gets the final say in the decision-making in my life? By what filter do I uh, filter out my actions through? And let me just take a pause and say, we, we, we establish our authority in really weird ways today. 
who we consider someone we should listen to or follow is really odd. If you've ever tried to publish a book like 30 years ago, you know how you had to do it? You had to write a good book. You know how you do it now? You have to have a good blog. You've got to tweet. You've got to have Instagram. You've got to have Facebook. You've got to have likes, views, comments, blog hits. And we establish authority. So people without any sort of talent whatsoever can literally build loads of authority and we all follow them. It's crazy. I mean, just look no further than Bravo or the E Channel and you will see loads of people with no talent that have tons of authority. <laughs> tons. Makeup brands, clothing, yoga pants, uh, companies, jewelry, all sorts of stuff. Zero talent, loads of authority. We view our authority in such odd ways. So what that means is that your authority might not be yourself. It literally might be somebody, some sort of, someone with some sort of social equity in your life, like uh, Oprah or Ellen or Justin Bieber or, or Deepak Chopra or somebody like that. You've, you said, I follow and do everything that person says. Look no further than someone that's on Whole30 and they will tell you that everything that book says is the Bible. And if you, don't, if you don't follow it, you're blaspheming and you deserve to eat that chocolate cake and cry yourself to sleep, okay? <laughs> Look no further than that. But I actually do believe that most people's authority is themselves. I really believe that. And this is how we know. We ask questions like this. We say, what have I learned? What have I read? What feels good to me? What makes me happy? What makes me unique? And then what we do is we emote all of this idea as we filter out all of the things people are teaching. And listen, we don't make the people that are teaching us the authority. That's key. If you go to college, college kid doesn't say, my professor's the greatest. He says, I'm now the greatest, now having learned what I learned in my community college class. That's what he says. <laughs> and now he's the greatest, smartest person you've ever met. And then what we do is we make truth claims based on what things make us feel. So we say, when we start sentences, this is, a, this is the test, okay? If you start sentences like this about really big truth claims, you say, I think that, dot, dot, dot. Now, if that's what you start everything about, what do you think about, what happens when you die? And you say, well, I think that, dot, dot, dot. Who, what are you saying about, you may say, I don't know the answer, but this is what I think. But oftentimes people don't do that. They say, well, based on my skimming of the Bible as a kid and my community college professor and you know, my Pinterest board, I think that um, you, know, you die and you live on a beach forever with your family and you eat pineapples. That sounds nice, maybe that's gonna happen. But again, it's not so much about what you feel. Authority is all about truth. So if you wanna tell, if you wanna, if you wanna figure out what the authority is, you don't ask the question, what do I feel? You ask the question, what's true? What's actually true? There's probably a lot of millennials in here. A lot of millennials get jobs, and I'm a millennial, so I get it. Like, we all, we all think we're really cool because we have the internet. So we, we go into work, we get a job because we need money, and we sit there and we get a boss we hate. Anybody got one of those? Don't, don't raise your hand if he's here. We, we get a boss we hate, and then we basically undermine him the entire time. We say, this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's silly. He's dumb, kind of talk about him during, you know, during the break and kind of joke about him. And then he comes to tell you something and you kind of go, yeah, whatever, you know, yeah, okay, whatever. And you're not really listening. And you go, I'm never doing what that boss says. And yeah, you may feel like you're authority over that man or that woman, right? You may feel that. But what happens when the boss says, hey, you, look at me, you're fired. Get out of here. What do you do? You get up and you go. You don't say, well, I don't really feel like you're the authority over me, and I, I, command, I command you to send me my paycheck every week. Doesn't work. The truth is, he's your boss, and you're fired, okay? That's the truth. So when we're establishing authority, we have to look, about the tr look at the truth. Jesus, in this passage that we're gonna read, is only making truth claims. He has said every sort of truth claim already, all in the Bible, but now he's gonna double down on his truth claims. He's gonna double down with his actions. So up until this point, he said things like, I am the way. Has anyone heard that? I am the way. I am the truth. 
I am the life. Nobody comes through the Father but by me. And you say, well, that's easy to say. Sure, I just said it. Does it make me God? Jesus has said, I will be coming on the clouds at the end of days, like a son of man. He says all these things. But now he seeks to authenticate his message that he is, in fact, God. He seeks to authenticate it. Now, for those that don't know the gospel message, what is this word I keep using? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ is who he says he is in the scripture. That Jesus lived a perfect life. He was God who bore flesh. He came down into the world. He lived a perfect life. If you've lived a perfect life at this point, say amen. No, no one, okay. So no one's been perfect, but Jesus was perfect. And Jesus lived the perfect life. And then he was so perfect that we killed him. We didn't like it. We, we didn't like that. He, we thought he was lying. We killed him. And because, he, because sin leads to death and Jesus had no sin, he rose from death three days later, conquering death. And he says that anybody who believes in him would never ever die and go to what we call hell, be apart from God forever, but that we would spend everlasting eternity with Jesus in the kingdom he's building. That's the message of the gospel. It's as clear as possible. And what Jesus wants to articulate here, or authenticate rather, is that he is God. So that's my thesis. My thesis is Jesus' miracles authenticate that Jesus is the Messiah that would save the world. Messiah means savior. What Jesus is about to do with miracles is put his money where his mouth is. Because anybody could say they're God. I mean, in San Francisco, there's a guy named Jim Jones. You ever heard of him? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. There's a lot of people that are claiming, making truth claims. But what is he about to do? He's gonna put his money where his mouth is. Show his authority. So, three things that Jesus authenticates with his miracles, and then one way we need to react to the way he's, what he's doing, okay? First, Jesus' miracles authenticate Jesus' authority over creation. Turn to verse thir- uh, 23, Matthew 8. Let's read it. He says, Then he got into the boat and the disciples followed him. Suddenly, a storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went in and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're gonna drown. He replied, oh, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obeyed him. Where was Jesus when the waves were coming into the boat? He was sleeping. Not only was he sleeping, I mean, he was passed out. I mean, think about, if you know anything about sleep, that he was in the fifth stage of REM, rapid eye movement. He was deep, gone, dreaming. He was in La La Land. He was not even thinking about it. And these disciples are up there freaking out. Jesus, wake up. And they go to him, help us, what are you gonna do? He's unmoved by the threat of creation, unmoved. He's, we're talking about the physical world, like the literal physical world, like this, that, all of this. Jesus is like, this is no threat to me. Rain, tsunamis, nothing. It's not a threat. And then he stops the storm, stops it, just like that. Now listen, Jesus isn't like some sort of X-Men, okay? He's not like some guy with a power and he's just, he didn't have like toxic ooze spilled on him as a teenager and then morphed into discovering who he was as a mutant and then decided he could control the weather. Although that's what a lot of the movies talk about. That's not what he's doing. He, he is unmoved by the threat of creation because he created creation. He created it. It's not a threat to him at all. And we've sensed God in his, in, his, in his physical world, don't we? Like the creation, we sense him. Have you ever been out on, on, a, on a beach and looked out at the sunset? It's amazing, isn't it? It feels like sometimes God is just writing his little signature for us. You stand at the foot of the Grand Canyon, you sense him. People that don't know Jesus, they can sense him too, right? That's called common grace. God gives us everybody the grace to enjoy his creation. Some might even think, that you can actually um, be in full communion with God in those moments. That you can actually be, sense, and reach God 
alone by yourself out in the water. And can you do that? You can feel God, you can sense the creation, but you cannot engage him in a loving, true, full relationship without everything God is claiming. You just can't. Let me put it this way. Let me put it, for those of you that feel challenged by that, let me, let me give you an example. So let's say you've got an awesome house, because I don't. So let's say you got an awesome house, okay? Big house in Hillsboro, wherever it is, and it's awesome. And you say, Eddie, that was a great sermon. You want to come over? And I'm like, yes, I want to come over. <laughs> You're like, I'll, I'll cook you some food at some point, and that'd be great. And I show up to your house in my bathrobe. I knock on the door, push you aside, and walk into your house. And I head right for your kitchen, because, you know, it's around lunchtime. And so I, I go right there and make myself a sandwich, use, your, use all your food, um, eat everything you've got, raid your freezer for your ice cream, use all your dishes, like one knife for that and one, you know, like fill in the whole dish sink up, come on, everything. And then after I'm done, I head up to the bathtub and I draw myself a nice warm bath because you have a nice bathtub. And I go in and I, get a, I draw myself an amazing bath and it's the perfect temperature and I get in and I eat chips to the glory of God and the joy of all people in your bathtub. <laughs> And then I don't drain it, but I go downstairs, freshly, freshly bathed, and then I go, I kick my feet up on your, on your coffee table, and I watch Netflix on your couch, and I ruin your cue, like I ruin everything, and you're, just, you're, you're livid. And you, what do you say to somebody that does this to your house? Get out of here. What are you doing, right? We do this to God all the time. We enjoy every single resource that God has. We go uh, surfing, we, that's my church. We say things like, my church is just surfing out in the water. That's not your church. That can't be a church. A church is a body of believers. It is a, it is a body of people. God calls us to be, engage him corporately. Yes, we have private salvation, but that faith is never meant to stay private. You don't get to uh, play golf to the glory of God for the rest of your life and say, Thank you, God, and never engage him. Now, you can play golf and enjoy it and give him glory for it, but there's more to it than that. He wants a relationship with you, not just you to use his resources. If you feel this way, you don't actually want God. You just want his stuff. You just want his resources, his things, and you want to use them and, and add them to everything that you're building for yourself on your way towards the life that you've built and the authority that you've set, okay? Okay? That's what Jesus is saying here. So, Jesus authenticates that, or that, that Jesus is the Messiah that would save the world, okay? That's the point. Jesus' miracles authenticate authority over the physical world. And now we move on to point two, that Jesus' miracles authenticate Jesus' authority over the spiritual world. Let's look at verse 28. Verse 28 in chapter eight says this. When he arrived at the other side of the region, of, of the Gadarenes, Two demon-possessed men come up from the tombs and met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. That's, that's freaky. Have you come here before, how have you come here to, to get us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. <clears throat> the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. They came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went to the town, and reported all this, including what, what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave his region. It's interesting that even when some certain, when lots of people, some of you in here, some, it was me at one point, openly reject God, we still kind of believe in like the spiritual world, right? So we watch like ghost hunters on TV and we watch like paranormal activity and we, we, we go to yoga class and we, we find our, you know, I don't know what they call it, inner circle or <laughs> chakra or whatever it is. You're, you're finding something, you're turning in heartward center and you're engaging the spiritual realm in some sense, right? We have this fascination with it. In the Bible, this is what's called the spiritual realm. It's the, this is the place where we can't really see that, that Satan and demons and, and the Holy Spirit and angels all, all live and are battling. But we call it, you know, our Pinterest board. We pin spiritual 
phrases on our Pinterest board and we say, we're spiritual. I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual, right? But Jesus easily, easily demonstrates his authority even over that spiritual world. The spiritual world that some of us claim, he demonstrates full authority over. I've got authority. So much so that this dude is demon-possessed, these two men, and I'm gonna cast them out into pigs and they're gonna go drown themselves in the water. Now, that seems kind of messed up, which explains why people ask them to leave. There's two reasons why people ask them to leave. One of them is this, their fear masters them because they saw for the first time ever that Jesus was who he says he was, that he has real authority, and that not only does he have authority, but there's another side. There's an evil. And he, they saw evil for real. And what they did was like, said, tell Jesus to get out of here because I just don't want to think about this right now. I've got a lot going. I mean, I got a job. I'm making money. I need to get married. There's a lot happening. And I can't think about that. Do you see where I'm going? You see where I'm going? There's another type of person. This person only is worried about preserving their earthly resources, these pigs. These pigs were probably gonna be sold for food. And so that was a lot of money they saw drown. Despite the fact that Jesus just demonstrated authority even over all of their resources, they still were upset about their bottom line. Some of us, if I'm honest, we have openly rejected preaching and proclaiming the name of Jesus because we literally thought it would affect our bottom line. Literally, that was the reason. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I, you literally said, well, what if I lose my job or what if um, you know, my boss doesn't like me and I don't get the promotion? What if that happens? If they find out a Christian, they might not hire me. We literally say that. We literally do the exact same thing that these men do. So before we, we want to be quick to judge them, we should know that we do the same things. And then the first people, they can't handle the truth of the world so they, it's, they think it's just best not to think about it. How many of us are there? Some of us, man, we've been sitting in church for so long. We've been sitting in church, we listen to sermons, read our Bible. We acknowledge the real, real world of God. We understand it's real, that it's an actual battle. And what happens? What do we say? I don't think so. I don't, I don't, have, the, I don't have the goal to do it. I, I'm just not gonna think about it. I got a lot more to go. I, I gotta get, I get, once I'm married, then I'll think about it. We said it. Okay, Jesus has demonstrated his authority over the physical world and over the spiritual. Here's the third point. Jesus' miracles authenticate Jesus' authority to forgive sin. So now he is about to demonstrate his authority, not just over the physical and the spiritual world, but over the very thing that can affect your eternity. So some of us have ideas about what eternity is gonna happen. Jesus says, this is what eternity is gonna happen. And I'm gonna double down and I'm gonna show you that I have authority over it. So if you, think, if you think your 80 or 90 years here on earth is short, it is because you're gonna spend eternity somewhere. And Jesus said, I got authority over that. Check this out, Matthew 9, verse one through eight. <clears throat> it says this, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to that man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this point, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, hmm, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat and go home. And then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and praised God who had given authority to such men. Now we get to, we've been picking on people that want to establish their own authority. Now we get to pick on the people that Jesus likes to pick on the most, the religious people. Jesus looks at the religious people who are essentially have established their own authority. And what they've done is they've essentially taken the world's authority of themselves and they put Christian stickers on it and put the mask on their own face. And they said, my, my authority is me because I read my Bible, because I pray, because I, I follow and I tithe. And they built their own authority, even as, even as someone would call themselves a Christian. 
They looked perfect outside, but inside they are dirty and unclean. Jesus calls us whitewashed tombs. You get the analogy? Beautiful architecture of a tomb inside. It's a dead body, still a dead body. That's what he's talking about when he looks at these people. Then he validates his truth claim by making someone who's never walked, walk. Like not in a movie or a video game, like for real. This guy gets up and walks. And everybody marveled at it. Now, I don't know about you, but like your yoga instructor's not doing that, okay? Like if someone does that, you gotta at least look back twice and go, what, what? The Bible's saying that Jesus did this. Listen, man, we may think that we get to decide our own lives in our heads, and we have this authority in our heads. But man, listen, there's only three pounds. You know, our head only weighs three pounds. We've only been around 30, 40, 60 years. Not that long. This book's been around. Do you know that this is the most published book in the world? By over 20,000 times? And you just write it off because of, I don't know, it seems like it's kind of preachy. You should at least give it a shot. Jesus is doubling down here. So Jesus is saying, I can, for, I can forgive sins. And listen, even if you have yourself as your own authority, you may, you may feel like, man, I'm, I'm, I've got everything together. I'm, I'm living the good life. But there's one thing you cannot do. You cannot undo all of the bad things you've done. Because you've done some things. You've hurt some people. You've stolen, you've said some things you shouldn't have, you hurt some feelings, you've done something wrong. You cannot pull that back. You can't get rid of that, it happened. At the very least, all you can do is not do it anymore. But it's still there, something has to happen with that pile. At best, all you can do is try to push what you've done out of your head. That's at best, and justify it. Well, I mean, it wasn't that big of a deal and it happened a long time ago, that was 30 years ago. At worst, it's eating you alive. It haunts you. What you've done masters you. But Jesus is saying, I got a better way. I'll take it. How about that? Why don't you take my righteousness, my perfect righteousness, and you give me you, and you wear me before God the Father, and you walk, then you'll be able to get through the gates, and you'll be made perfect and righteous and clean. He's not trying to be an evil dictator over your life telling you what to do. He's trying to give you a better life. Jesus now gives us a response. How do we respond to his miracles? Okay, it's this. He says at the end of that verse, take up your mat and go. Some of us have known the truth about God for so long, but we've never acted on it. It's been in us that we need to encounter Jesus for real life change and forgiveness of sins, but we haven't. We've just sat here learning. Some of us have been running from God's authority because we feel like we just need to clean ourselves up before we engage God. Listen, there is not a nice enough tie that you can wear that's gonna make you look good enough before the Father without Jesus Christ. There's not one you can buy. Even if you go to Saks Fifth Avenue or some really stupidly expensive store, it's not enough. You need something else. And some of us have been hurt by others. Some of us have had horrible things done to us and that's why we don't engage God. We say, how could a God, how could a God allow that to happen to me? Man, I'm with you. I grew up, my mom died when I was 13. We grew up in section eight, poor bouncing from house to house. My dad left me when I was nine. Um, I got one younger sister. I don't have any family. I moved back to San Francisco. I'm from here. I don't have any family. None. I have a few, few good, solid people that loved me when I was a kid. I don't have family cookouts to go to. Like, I could blame God for that. It's messed up. I'm with you. But Jesus has good news for us too. He wants to free us from not only what we've done, but the things that have been done to us. We have the ability to be made clean, new, and righteous in Jesus. And we can wear white and be beautiful despite what's been done to us because we don't wear our broken identities. We wear his perfect, clean identity. We have that opportunity. That's amazing. And yet some of us still sit here convinced in our own authority that we rule our lives and to you guys, 
I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Because I, I, feel, I feel sorry that you think the life you can create for you is better than the life Jesus can give you. And you just don't have any clue what you're missing. Your stock options and your 401k and man, your... Uh, Jesus gives you a life that's better than the life you're living. Not momentary happiness where like I have a party and I'm happy for a few hours or go to a, 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 eat birthday cake or, or have some ice cream or you know, engage in a relationship and happy, happy, happy. But in, in the middle, there's lulls of depression and anxiety and stress. I'm talking about long momentary joy in the same direction. That's what Jesus brings. You will never find that searching for your own authority. You'll never find it. I can guarantee you, you will not. At the best, it'll make you angry and assertive and proud. At worst, you'll be in despair and depression if you don't get it. But for all of us, it's time to take our mat. It's time to take up our mat. It's time to go. It's time to encounter Jesus, read scriptures, be radical, be an outsider, be an exile, do something crazy, give your money away, join a church, Partake in a marriage. If you're, if you're here and you're, get married, have children, start a life, pour yourself out for the better of others. What would that look like? Enjoy the joy that God has for you, not the happiness you're trying to manufacture for yourself. And last thing, Jesus says this, that may sound good, but you gotta count the cost. That may sound good, but you gotta count the cost. Verse 18 through 22, I'm not gonna read it all, but it says, one man comes up to Jesus and he says, I'm gonna follow you wherever you go, Jesus. And the guy says, Jesus says back to him, well, actually foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't, I don't, I don't have anywhere to go. Jesus says, I'm homeless, do you understand that? The next guy comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm coming, but first, like, let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Two very different responses, two types of people. Overeager, under eager. First guy's very over eager. I'll do anything you say, Jesus. I'll do anything you want, no matter what, I swear. And Jesus says, actually, do you know what this is gonna cost you? Do you know this may cost you your friends? Do you know this may cost you just family? Do you know that people aren't gonna like you as much? Do you know that it could cost you a job? Do you know that? You gotta be real. Under eager. The guy says, first, let me go bury my father. That sounds kind of nice, right? Just a quick burial, right? Some commentators actually think, that this is really an idiom for something. This idiom saying this, quote, let me wait until my father is dead. Meaning, Jesus, I see what you're saying and I'm gonna do it, but let me get this done first. How many of you said that? A lot. Once I get married, once I'm out of debt, once my finances are in order, once I'm on my deathbed, once I get it out of my system, once I've straightened out my life, two wannabe disciples, one over eager, one under eager, both recognize their need for Jesus, but both fail to understand the true authority that comes with the Son of Man, Jesus. So, conclusion. Who is your authority? Answer the question in your head. Who's your authority? You? Someone else? Because Jesus has pushed his chips in. He's, he said it and he's shown you. So he's either crazy, he's lying, or he's God. So which is it? Let me pray for you guys. Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends. So many come here today, heavy laden, Lord God, needing a refresher, needing the truth. I pray that you give them to them in this moment through worship by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of my friends come here not knowing anything about you. I pray that you radically deliver them and show them your transforming power Lord Jesus, I pray everyone gets motivated to go out, to scatter, to go be missionaries for the world in their workplaces. Maybe they're calling them to plant, go plant a church. Maybe they're calling them to get more involved at New North, to double down. Maybe they're calling them to give their money away, to, to witness to their neighbor, to make friends in, com with com in communities that people don't look the same as them. Lord, you've got something amazing for everybody in here. And I'm praying that you can reveal yourself in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.